You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 99. Hey, I'm your host, Dr. Yami. I'm a board certified pediatrician, certified health and wellness coach, author, and speaker. I'm also a passionate promoter of the power of diet and lifestyle in preventing and reversing chronic disease and bringing joy and longevity into our lives. This podcast is focused on plant-based nutrition, habit formation, motivation, and mindset so that you can have the tools to live the best life possible. Are you ready to get started? Let's do this. So grateful to be on this journey and encourage other people to join me to help this planet and the animals. Happy Sunday, veggie lovers. Welcome back to Veggie Doctor Radio. I have another interesting episode for you today from a vegan veterinarian. So I know that you're going to enjoy hearing about all the things that she has to say about how to raise a healthy pet with a vegan diet. But before we get to that, just want to remind you about signing up for my newsletter, two ways to do it. You can text the word fiber, F-I-B-E-R, to the number 66866, or you can go to my website, dryami.com, D-O-C-T-O-R-Y-A-M-I.com forward slash sign up. In addition, if you haven't already read my book, A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy, I would love it if you grabbed a copy, either paperback or in ebook or in audiobook. Let me know what you think. So this book is pretty much a lifestyle medicine book for kids and families, but in it, I also talk about intuitive eating, how to help your child develop a healthy relationship with food, let go of those mealtime, dinner table battles, and feed your kid in a joyful and loving way. So for those of you that have already gotten yourself a copy, thank you so much. I appreciate you. If you've written a review, thank you so much. If you've gotten a copy, please, if you could leave me a review on amazon.com, that would be so appreciated. Speaking of reviews, Here is a five-star review on Apple Podcast for my podcast by Heart Port Muto. The title is Upbeat and Informative. As a vegan who tries to eat mostly plant-based, I struggle occasionally with really making healthy choices. Listening to this podcast keeps me motivated to do that. The Veggie Doctor is so upbeat and I look forward to a new podcast that come out each week. Well, thank you, Heart Port Muto. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I really appreciate you leaving that amazing review. Thank you so much. And just as a reminder, the information on this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not meant to replace careful evaluation and treatment. So if you have concerns about you, your child, or your pet's nutrition or growth, please contact a health professional. So let's talk about Dr. Armaiti May. So she is a vegan veterinarian, and I wanted to have her on the show because I feel like that's still an area where there's a lot of questions. People are wondering, can you really raise your pet vegan with a plant-based diet? And so she answers those questions on this episode. So Dr. May is a practicing small animal veterinarian and vegan advocate. From a young age, she loved animals and knew she wanted to devote her life to helping them. She grew up in Santa Monica and attended Samohi, where she graduated in 1997 before attending UC Berkeley, where she graduated with a BS in Bioresource Sciences in 2001. A 2005 graduate of the University of California, Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, Dr. May worked at an emergency dog and cat hospital and then trained in veterinary acupuncture through the Qi Institute of Chinese Medicine. From, for the past nine years, she has had a veterinary house call practice for dogs and cats in the Los Angeles area. How cool is that? A house call vet, that's so fun. 
Dr. May has volunteered offering spay and neuter services to disadvantaged communities locally and abroad, including Guatemala and Nicaragua. She has served on the board of directors for Red Rover, an animal organization that brings animals out of crisis and into care, and is currently the president of Vegan Toastmasters, a public speaking organization which empowers vegans to speak effectively on behalf of animals. Dr. May completed her certification in animal chiropractic from Options for Animals in 2015. Currently, she runs a nonprofit organization called the Veterinary Association for the Protection of Animals to educate the veterinary profession about the benefits of veganism and encourage veterinary schools to offer humane surgical teaching methods in their curriculum. Well, Dr. May is certainly a brilliant veterinarian who has so much training, so much compassion, so much love for animals. She has a lot to offer. After we got off of the interview, she wanted me to mention another website that would be very helpful for learning more about feeding your pet a plant-based diet. It's called plantbased.dog. So P-L-A-N-T-B-A-S-E-D dot D-O-G. That's pretty cool. That's another resource. And her website is veganvet.net, veganvet.net. I really hope that you enjoy this episode. You learn a lot from it. It might raise a few other questions, though. I know that after I talk to Dr. May, there's things that I want to look up and um, look into a little bit more because she has some ideas of things that I've never even thought about. So I hope that you enjoy it. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday and a plantastic week, and I will catch you right back here next week. Dr. Armaithi May, thank you so much for being a guest on Veggie Doctor Radio today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, I was so happy to find you because I have so many questions for you. I really have wanted to have a vet on the show to talk about our pets and what is the pros and cons, the do's and don'ts of raising pets in a vegan lifestyle. But first of all, I want to hear more about you and your vegan journey. Can you give us a little bit more about your background and why you became vegan? Absolutely. I was uh, fortunate to be raised nearly vegetarian. Uh, My mom's father, grandfather, witnessed a pig being slaughtered in Malaysia on their way from India to the United States. And at that point, he vowed with my grandmother never to eat land animals again. And that started a tradition uh, amongst, um, on my mom's side of the family, uh, to embrace vegetarianism. So I was raised vegetarian. And then when I learned about the cruelty in the egg and dairy industries, reading a book called Diet for New America by John Robbins, really opened my eyes. And at that point I went vegan and I've been vegan for about 20 years now. So it's something that I'm, I'm really fortunate to have made a decision about early in life, relatively speaking. And I'm so grateful to be on this journey and encourage other people to join me to help this planet and the animals. Wow. So is this, um, culture of caring for animals and valuing animals' lives, is that something that's part of your family life? Did that get passed down to you from your grandfather and and your parents? In a sense, yes, in that I'm a Zoroastrian, that's my religion, and I was raised that way, and my my name, Armighty, actually comes from Zoroastrianism. Armighty means devotion to God, and it's um, from one of the seven Amisha Spentas, which are angel-like figures, and our mighty's job is to take care of the earth, interestingly enough. Wow. So there is that connection. However, a lot of Zoroastrians, unfortunately, do eat meat. But in our heritage, if you go back, looking at the literature, I mean, the scriptures, you can see there's there's definitely a base for vegetarianism. In fact, I've spoken about this at a number of Zoroastrian congresses over the years, And I have also spoken about it uh, more recently in a film that debuted last year called A Prayer for Compassion, which draws from a number of different faiths, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, showing that the, the, the common theme in all these religions is compassion. And that ties right in with a vegan lifestyle. So 
I try to tap into that when I can. I've given talks at Zoroastrian congresses showing that you know, we really should be following this diet. In fact, our religion mandates or requests that people follow a, a plant-based diet or a meat-free diet, at least during what's called the month of Baman. Baman is for animal welfare. And during that month, meat is supposed to be abstained from, but a lot of people don't follow it, just like they don't follow a lot of other things. But the core of the religion does have that in there. And so my sort of argument is that if we're supposed to abstain from meat during this one month and also certain other days of other months that are for animal welfare and other things pertaining to animals uh, safety and so forth that why should we be eating meat at any time mm. and by extension dairy and eggs since we know that the way animals are treated to produce those foods is very cruel Wow, that's super fascinating. And I haven't heard of that religion before, so I'll definitely have to do more research on that and learn more about it. Very fascinating. So you've wanted to be a veterinarian since you were very small. Were you surprised when you came into this profession, into this career, that more veterinarians aren't vegan? Why do you think it is? It's a fascinating question that I've spent a lot of time contemplating. There is a tremendous amount of cognitive dissonance in our society, and, and that permeates into the veterinary profession, so much so that they have actual courses and tracks of learning that are called food animal medicine, for example. And the very term food animal medicine to a vegan is inherently inf offensive why would you label an animal as a food animal just because he or she is a member of a particular species? It was hard for me starting in vet school. I was one of only a handful of vegans out of a class of 122 students. And before my first day of classes, I had put a whole bunch of stickers on my locker that said things like love animals, don't eat them, protect farm animals, go vegan. Lo and behold, before I knew it, the first six weeks into the quarter, uh, I was called into uh, the associate dean's office and told one of my classmates complained my locker stickers were offensive. That was a rude awakening. It was a, a, a wild ride to say the least, but I got through it and I still am working to raise awareness amongst the veterinary professional. I'll, I'll talk more about that uh, later in the interview, but uh, I have, I've started an organization which is uh, aimed at raising awareness about the benefits of veganism within the veterinary profession. So it, it is a process, it is happening slowly, it needs to definitely expand, and I think it, it takes a village to bring this shift about. Yeah. And I mean, that's so incredible. And cognitive dissonance is the perfect way to describe it because I feel that there's so many vets that describe themselves as animal lovers and they get to see day in and day out, especially the vets that work with farm animals. They get to see these animals. They, they see their suffering. They see their personalities. And yet they're not going that next step of choosing to change their lifestyle because they're stuck in this paradigm that, well, this is the way that things are. And that's what I talked about in my TED talk too, is this cognitive dissonance. And we're seeing a problem. Maybe we're feeling a little bit of pain, but the other part of us is like, well, you know, that's just the way it is. That's the way the world works. That's what my parents told me. That's what my grandparents told me that this is just the way it is. So we're just going to keep following the status quo. But I can see how for somebody like you, that could just be so frustrating. Were there any times that you thought, well, I can't even be part of this profession because everybody around me just doesn't seem to get it. Before I started vet school, when I was in undergrad at, at UC Berkeley, I had a real struggle with a biology class that I was taking in that they were requiring dissections. And I came to a point where I, I had a, a bit of a, a confrontation with my professor because he said, listen, if you're not going to do these dissections, you shouldn't be a biology major, let alone go in, into vet school. And I was really struck by that. But eventually we, we reached a sort of compromise that I would watch them, but not actually do them. And I got through that course, but it got me thinking. And then I started talking to vet students about what happens in veterinary school. 
And I became aware that they have what are known as terminal surgeries where they take animals, sometimes from the shelters who are healthy and put them under anesthesia, perform surgeries on them that aren't necessarily in the animal's best interest. And then in some cases kill or quote unquote euthanize them afterwards which is certainly a, a, a terrible thing to do to a, an innocent animal. And so when I came to learn of these things, it, it was very concerning to me. And I tried to research ways of being able to pursue my dream of being a veterinarian, which I had had since being a, a little girl that wouldn't compromise my ethics. It uh, ultimately led me when I was in vet school to seek out the Student Animal Welfare Committee, which I became president of, and we coordinated a surgery training wet lab in which students performed surgeries with faculty supervision on cadavers to get surgery training experience. And the cadavers were donated by guardians whose dogs and cats had died of natural causes or were euthanized for humane medical reasons rather than being purpose bred or purpose killed for the purpose of teaching. Since that point, the school uh, eliminated the terminal surgeries that were offered in the elective small animal surgical curriculum and replaced it with a rotation during senior year during which students could perform needed surgeries on animals whose guardians weren't able to afford the regular fees that would they otherwise would have to pay and this was a win-win for all concerned because the students got training experience doing surgeries, the faculty were there to supervise them and help out, and the pets got the needed care and surgical interventions needed that the guardians requested. So that's a model that can spread to other vet schools, and that's actually another aim of my nonprofit organization, VAPA, the Veterinary Association for the Protection of Animals, because countless people have come up to me or contacted me through email and other means over the years asking what they can do because they want to become veterinarians and they don't want to have to sacrifice their beliefs or hurt animals in order to become veterinarians either. And it's something that we really need to be focusing on, and this is something that can help animals in the long run because if we have more animal friendly veterinarians more animal advocates as veterinarians we can make a dramatic paradigm shift happen in the world of animal protection as a whole wow absolutely well thank you for your advocacy and the work that you did from the very beginning really advocating for animals but me as a physician i mean that makes total sense right because in our medical school training we don't just like get healthy people off the street and be like, all right, we're just going to try this surgery on you here. You know, we, we work with cadavers, we work with computer models, uh, we work with simulations, and then we have rotations where we're standing next to our mentors teaching us the surgeries on somebody that actually needs a surgery or needs a procedure done. So it seems like that makes the most sense. And I'm glad that some vet schools are starting to pick up on that instead of sacrificing the poor, innocent animals. Well, let's go ahead and get into talking about vegan pets. So first of all, I want to know, you know, probably the most common household pets, I'm assuming, are dogs and cats. I'm sure there's an other in the top five common household pets. But which of our household pets can safely eat a vegan diet? It's a great question. So dogs are omnivores and they can thrive on a plant-based diet in most, if not all cases, as long as they're eating a nutritionally complete and balanced diet. And that is important that they eat a nutritionally complete and balanced diet. The, the truth is that dogs and cats have nutrient requirements, but that's not the same as having ingredient requirements. So particularly with dogs, since they are omnivores, they can get those nutrient requirements met through plant, mineral, and synthetic sources. Cats are known to be very finicky eaters, so it is harder with cats, and they are technically carnivores. However, even cats, some of them, are able to maintain their health and do quite well, provided they eat the food, of course, and that their urinary tract health is monitored, which I can talk more about later. But uh, as far as the species and then of course rabbits and or there are plenty of other species that are naturally herbivorous that would do uh, just fine eating a plant-based diet and, and in fact that's what they should be eating. 
Okay. Well, let's talk about dogs first. Um, you said that there's specific nutrients that they need. So what do we need to consider or keep in mind when we want to transition our dogs to a vegan diet? Yes. So dogs do need more protein than humans do. They, uh, they need about a gram of protein per pound of body weight. Uh, they, they of course need a whole range of, um, minerals, vitamins, amino acids, fatty acids, and, and carbohydrates are needed too. So what I suggest is to choose one of the commercially available AFCO approved vegan diets which you can find in your grocery stores or order online. And AFCO, which is the American Association of Feed Control Officials, gives a stamp of approval on a pet food if it meets certain baseline requirements of nutritional adequacy. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the best food in the world, but we know that it meets those minimum standards at least. And from studies that have been done looking at heavy metal toxins, carcinogen levels, and, and other harmful ingredients that find their way into meat-based pet foods, which include dis diseased, disabled, dying, dead body parts that are slaughterhouse rejects. We know that meat-based food is inherently problematic, aside from the ethical issues, which are, which are there, of course. But cancer is becoming an increasing concern in the dog population. 50% of dogs suffer from cancer. So it's happening more and more, and it's happening at younger ages than it used to happen. And this could be multifactorial. It, it may be a combination of other things as well. However, I think that food does play a major role, and it's something they're consuming every single day. So having Attention paid to the quality of the ingredients is important. However, it's important to realize that even if someone gets an organic meat-based formula, it is still filled with toxins because of persistent organic pollutants. So due to bioaccumulation of toxins up the food chain, there is a very high level of mercury, uh, in seafood particularly. Uh, arsenic is found in a lot of chicken. We have uh, stain proofing chemicals, fire retardants, carcinogens, neurotoxins. There was a, a study which uh, looked at dogs' blood and urine samples and found them to be contaminated with 35 chemicals, including 11 carcinogens, 31 chemicals toxic to the reproductive system, and 24 neurotoxins. Seven of the chemicals averaged at least five times higher than found in people, and another seven averaged uh, about two and a half times more than in people. Uh, those were the, the stain and grease proof coating or perfluorochemicals. Then that was uh, by the Environmental Working Group, and there was another study of heavy metals um, found in pet foods in the spectro spectroscopy magazine in January of 2011, which compared 31 dry and 21, uh, seven, 27 wet foods uh, for dogs and cats. And these range from bargain uh, to high-end products. And they found alarmingly high levels of mercury, over 120 times the reference dosage limit as well as levels of vanadium, uranium, cadmium, and thallium, which greatly exceeded the reference dosage limit guidelines. Wow. That's super scary. Definitely. And these are just commercially available dog foods, but these are the ones that are made traditionally with meats and, and those kinds of things in there. Absolutely. Okay. So um, let's, go, let's go back. And then I want to talk more about the benefits of, of feeding our dogs a vegan diet. But whenever you're talking about the AFCO approved, is there a place where people can go search? Because you said that some of these uh, dog foods are available at your grocery store. How do we find which vegan dog foods are ones that we could just get where we live? And I know that there's some companies that are shipping and having, you know, like the regular shipments, um, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. So how can people find a way to um, look for these dog foods and see what's going to work for them as far as affordability and ease of purchase. 
Oh, okay. Well, yeah, the, the ease of purchase is usually feasible if they're doing a commercial plant-based food. There, there are a number of brands. There's Pet Guard that has a vegan formula, vegan organic formula in a can, and they also have a dry food. There's Natural Balance, Nature's Recipe that you can generally find in commercial uh, available retail outlets. Also, uh, more brands are becoming available. There's um, Halo that has a vegan formula, uh, Gather, Benevo, Evolution, V Dog, Ami Dog. Those ones are available online. And I know V Dog has free shipping. So if you order in bulk, you can usually get um, free shipping at a certain point or, or at least reduce shipping costs. And if you really want to save money, uh, you can actually make your own food, but you do want to make sure you follow a, a guided recipe, like this book by Dr. Richard Pitcairn. It's the, the fourth edition of the Complete Guide to Natural Health for Dogs and Cats, which has plant-based recipes. You want to make sure you get the fourth edition because that's the edition that shows the, the plant-based recipes that was rewritten after uh, Dr. Pitcairn and his wife went vegan after watching Cowspiracy, incidentally, about six years ago. Wow. Yeah, so they realized a lot of this uh, information and decided to update their book because of that. So if you do home cooking, you definitely want to make sure to add in a supplement that's uh, meeting their micronutrient needs. So CompassionCircle.com has a bunch of different supplement mixes for different life stages for both dogs and cats if people do want to do the home cook otherwise if you buy the commercially available you can just feed that you don't need to give any supplements okay so just to make it clear the ones that you've listed are the afco approved and i'm assuming it's got yes. some kind of little seal or something on the bag that says it's afco approved maybe or you can look it up on the company's website and yeah, then you, if you'll you, be able to see on the label it'll say it's afco standards are met yeah perfect and then if you feed your dog that that already has all of the vitamins and nutrients in it so you don't have to worry about give, giving an additional supplement right but there's also the opportunity to make food for your dogs which i think is really cool might be a little bit more time consuming. And if you do that, then you would have to make sure that your dog gets a supplement to make sure that they're meeting all of their essential nutrient needs. So, and then we'll definitely link that book because I want to get my hands on a copy of that as well. Can we do a combination? I've been seeing people online doing a combination of doing some dry kibble, but also adding in like sweet potatoes and some rice and things like that. Um, could you guide us a little bit about doing a little bit of both? A combination of home cooked and commercially available. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. I think as long as you're at least giving 50% of the commercial, then I would be okay with giving um, the other half home cooked if, if they're not doing the supplements. But if they do more than that, then they should really consider adding in a supplement to avoid deficiencies. But yeah, I think um, sweet potatoes are really good for the digestion brown rice, sometimes white rice, depending on if, if the animal has diarrhea, sometimes like dogs can benefit from a little white rice to help bind them up. But in general, like whole grains are preferred. Also pumpkin can really help with regulating the digestive process. Uh, if it's constipation or diarrhea, it actually can help with both. And greens uh, to add in some, some phytonutrients because we're all probably in need of more greens in our diets with the amount of stress that we are under in today's world. I think it's important to have fresh foods in our diets and uh, greens supply a lot of nutrients. So yeah, green beans and also for helping with weight loss because a lot of pets these days are overweight or obese and that, that definitely has um, a negative effect on their health, their longevity, their joint health. So uh, by eating more, you know, green beans, broccoli, it reduces the caloric density of the food they're taking in so they don't have to be hungry and they can still achieve their weight loss goals. Mm -hmm. And is there a certain percentage of raw versus cooked or are there certain foods that are better to cook to give to our animal? Is, are all of them okay to eat raw? I think cooking for most dogs is 
important because they're not as accustomed to digesting the raw vegetables even though they do have enzymes for digesting carbohydrates in fact more than wolves do they still can have some issues with digestion if it's a raw vegetable being given i mean with some exceptions and there is variation amongst different dogs but in general especially to minimize gas it's, it's a good idea to um, steam the vegetables and you can even puree them um, so that uh, it's, it's a little easier to digest. There are some times when they can eat, you know, a little bit of raw carrot or cucumber or that kind of thing, and even a little bit of the other vegetables. It, but if too much of that is done, it can lead to excess gas and, um, you know, they just don't get all the nutrients because a lot of dogs, unfortunately, they just kind of wolf things down, you know, the expression. So they don't chew it as thoroughly as they, they ought to maybe, but we can't really instruct them to chew their food thoroughly. So <laughs> if we do some of the work um, for them or even sometimes pureeing can help, you know, especially with the beans and the legumes, pureeing them um, so, so they're broken down more before feeding can be a good thing. Okay, great. That was super helpful. All right. Well, let's go and talk more about the benefits. So definitely you're talking about cancer and how when dogs are eating this traditional dog food, they're exposed to more heavy metals, more environmental pollutants, which we definitely don't want for our dogs. But what other chronic health problems can dogs get that eating in this way is going to help decrease their risk of? Yes, so skin problems is a big one. I've seen numerous dogs who suffer from skin allergies, and food allergy is a, a big component of that. So the meat toxins present a, a major contributor to food allergies, particularly beef, chicken, lamb, and those are, are found in, in so many meat-based pet foods. So by Switching to a plant-based diet, uh, those dogs can have a much better quality of life because they're not constantly chewing, licking, scratching, especially if they're licking their feet. That is often an indicator of food allergy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how common are allergies in pets? I feel like, you know, my previous dog who's unfortunately passed, um, she was allergic to everything. She was itchy all the time. And I see that sometimes other dogs seem to have these symptoms of how common are allergies in dogs? I think they're very common. I, I don't know percentage wise, but I would say probably one of the, the most common conditions that we see in veterinary medicine, you know, maybe as much as a quarter of, of the patients that I see have some type of skin allergy issue. And so uh, why is that? It could be a large part of it due to their genetics being purebreds, uh, also the environment and the food they're eating, I think all contribute and over vaccination can cause hypersensitivity and increase allergy problems as well. Interesting. Okay. So you said that they lick their paws, anything else that they do? Do they just seem to like roll around and rub themselves or what other signs can we see in our pets if they may have allergies? Uh, scratching, biting, um, their feet will become, if they're a white haired dog, they'll turn brown. Uh, it'll, it'll look like a kind of a brown tinge on their feet because of the salivary staining. Mm. So even if you don't necessarily observe them licking, if you see that brown, that's often an indicator that they've been licking maybe when you weren't looking. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's mo mainly from scratching, chewing and biting that you would get that indication of um, a skin allergy. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what particular foods our dogs should not consume? I mean, we all know about chocolate. Definitely don't yes. give your dogs chocolate. But are there any other plant-based foods that we really shouldn't be feeding our dogs? Yes. Raisins are not to be fed to dogs. They can have a toxin, which causes uh, kidney problems. So um, don't feed raisins or grapes. Also, uh, don't feed onions. Onions cause anemia, 
So um, yeah, don't feed those. And also, well, of course, chocolate, marijuana, definitely. I mean, should go without saying, but I have encountered situations in practice where that was either fed accidentally or like the dog like tore through the bag and ate a big chocolate or something. Uh, yeah, chocolate can be very toxic if it's a small dog eating dark chocolate or baker's chocolate is the worst as far as potency. It's really dose dependent though. So if if like a big lab eats a little milk chocolate or something, it's not that big of a deal. They'll probably have diarrhea for a day and be fine. But if it's a small dog eating like even a little bit of dark chocolate, it can be quite life-threatening and require emergency care. So uh, in general, what I would say is, you know, if you know that your dog got into something, call your vet. And most times it is able to be having emesis induced, you know, vomiting. So that way it's eliminated from the system. There are, you know, a few unusual situations where that may be contraindicated, but just talk to your vet as soon as feasible if that happens or take, take the dog in and they can help induce the emesis if it's warranted. And if it's gone beyond that point, like let's say you were out of town or you know went out somewhere and then came back and you discovered the dog ate something he shouldn't have eaten, then uh, they can still do what's called activated charcoal to bind the toxins. And then it helps to eliminate out um, of the animal system and they can do IV fluids. Sometimes they even pump the stomach. It depends what it is that they ate. Yeah, so uh, also macadamia nuts are off limits for dogs. Okay, great. And any kind of dough, like, um, you know, yeast that can rise, it can cause major stomach problems. Okay, all right. That was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Do dogs get the typical chronic illnesses that humans get? Like, do they get heart disease and type 2 diabetes and things like that? They don't get the same type of heart disease typically, but they do get heart issues. In fact, dogs can get dilated cardiomyopathy uh, if they don't have enough taurine, which is sometimes implicated in the vegan diet if it's not supplemented with taurine. There, there are certain breeds of dogs in particular, uh, the deep chested breeds like St. Bernard's, Great Danes, and um, Afghan hounds and other breeds that are prone to uh, Doberman Pinterest, I think I mentioned, uh, they're prone to di DCM or dilated cardiomyopathy. And they, in particular, may uh, need to have that supplemented if they're on a vegan diet or if uh, even if they're not, just to make sure you know they're not developing those signs. You can have a test done, uh, have an echocardiogram done, which is a ultrasound of the heart. But as far as um, heart attacks from cholesterol, I have not seen that in, you know, in my experience. With uh, diabetes, we do see that on um, an occasion, not as commonly as in humans, but, you know, it is, it is seen from time to time. I think it's a combination of genetics and um, lifestyle, like dogs who are, are genetically prone to it or predisposed to it can get it and then dogs that are uh, that are eating too much of the toxins I mean I guess the body has different ways of reacting to it plus in some cases it's an immune mediated condition where the you know the pancreas is attacking itself and it's not secreting the insulin properly so there are some unanswered questions there and you know why that is is it due to over vaccination you know there there are questions that can be explored further but um, it's not as common as in the human population. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Um, how can we tell if our pets are thriving? What are the signs that they're doing well? And what are some things that we might, might want to look out for as a sign that they're not doing as well as we'd like them to? Yeah, so a thriving pet should be a happy pet, first and foremost. Uh, you know, a dog should be wagging his or her tail, should be enjoying physical activity, going on walks, uh, hikes, places, or, you know, if that's not an option, you know, take your dog to a dog park. Oh, hopefully it's protected from, you know, dogs who are aggressive. That problem can happen sometimes, but 
taking your dog out into nature um, is important. If you have a cat, I think enrichment, because cats really should be indoors for the most part. I think um, there are safety issues with being hit by car and also predators that can attack them and other issues. So, you know, unless you do a cat fence, which is an option, some people can do that or, you know, build like an outdoor enclosure or train your cat to walk on a leash, you know, that's, that's an option too. But yeah, you could definitely provide enrichment. So you can set up cat trees, you can put catnip on them, get your cat engaged and active playing with toys. So that brings uh, joy to their lives and that's important, okay? And then um, making sure they have attention, you know, love. They get lonely too, just like we do. You know, they need that social interaction. Making sure they have fresh, clean water. So I give spring water to my cat and I change it out. You know, I make sure that it's a high quality water that's no fluoride or other toxins in it. And the air quality, you know, if they're sneezing or having respiratory issues, make sure there's no excess dust in the air. You can use an air filter if there's a concern with that. Open the window, let the fresh air come in. Make sure that if they do have a change in their routine or a change in their behavior, if they're all of a sudden not engaging as they normally do or lethargic that you get them checked out and find out what's going on because they can't talk to us they can't tell us oh you know my back hurts or I have this pain in my abdomen they they are just gonna act differently and it's up to us to see there's something there that's not right that needs to be explored further and that's where you know diagnostics come in first starting with an exam and determining what else may need to be done, whether it's blood tests, urinalysis, radiographs, ultrasound, et cetera. And then finding a plan um, once there is some sort of diagnosis of what we can do to treat that animal, provide comfort, alleviation of discomfort, and perhaps some vitamin supplements, perhaps acupuncture, other uh, there are herbs that can be given to help with pain relief, to boost the immune system, that help with bleeding control. There are all sorts of herbs that are out there that have you know quite impressive actions that, that can help our animal friends. There's also homeopathy that's a very gentle way of treating an animal that doesn't involve some of the harsh side effects that conventional drug therapy can have. So there, there's a you know multifaceted approach that can be used to treating our, our animal friends. And we want to be responsive to their needs. And we also want to think about their quality of life. I think there are times when too much is done, in fact, in terms of putting an animal through a whole lot of procedures and treatments and this and that. It just gets to a point where, you know, if they're not enjoying their life, we need to honor and respect that too and not prolong things unduly. Mm -hmm. So basically what you're saying is if your if your pet is energetic and happy, wants to engage with you, wants to go out in nature, if it's a dog, then your pet's probably thriving. But if you're seeing that it's changed in behavior, low energy, maybe lethargic, having some of those signs, then it's probably a good idea to get them evaluated. And when you do, there's all kinds of options for both diagnosing and treating an animal. And I think it's so cool that you have training in so many different areas with the acupuncture and chiropractic. I didn't even know that existed for animals. So yeah. that, that's so cool that you have so many tools in your toolbox to help these animals and ease their suffering and help them lead a higher quality of life. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a fascinating uh, array of tools that we have available to help these animals, and I like having different options available because every case is a little different. You know, every animal is an individual, and every guardian has various different things to consider, cost-wise, et cetera. So, I try to be formulating a plan that that fits with with that individual animal and his or her guardian's lifestyle and and needs. 
That's fascinating. Well, what do you wish more people knew? Wow, there's so many things. I, I think that watching documentaries about what happens to animals is, is so key to learning about the vegan lifestyle, uh, Forks Over Knives, Cowspiracy, Peaceable Kingdom, Called to Rescue. Called to Rescue is a film that VAPA, the Veterinary Association for the Protection of Animals, showed to a hospital uh, and we had vegan food catered and a lot of great questions afterwards. And people found that it was watchable. It wasn't too intense, which sometimes people are afraid to even watch a documentary because of the graphic footage. And this film called The Rescue has no graphic footage, but it does give a description of what happens to the animals. So people can learn about it and they can also see that these animals, chickens, turkeys, goats, pigs, cows, etc. They are unique dynamic individuals with personalities just like our dogs and cats. They have desires, they want to be loved. And you can see this in the sanctuary settings they're allowed to live in in this film called to rescue. Of course, if you have an opportunity to visit a farm sanctuary in person and give a pig a belly rub, let a chicken sit in your lap, you know, let a, a cow uh, lick your hand, it'll be a life-changing experience and you won't see those animals as commodities anymore. You see them as unique individuals who want to live and we owe it to them to respect that. Yeah. Well, thanks for bringing that up because I do feel like there's a lot of people that may decide not to see a certain documentary because they really are afraid of how it's going to affect them emotionally. Uh, some people are very empathic and watching some of those images is just really difficult for them. So we'll definitely link that documentary called to rescue. And I'm very grateful for all the people who sacrifice their time, their energy, their finances to have these farm sanctuaries. God bless them because they're doing such important work. Um, so I'm very grateful that they're taking their time to, to help these animals. What personal habit are you most proud of? How did you develop it and how do you maintain it? I believe in a higher power. Uh, I was raised that way. Uh, I believe in God. I'm a Zoroastrian, as I mentioned earlier. And I think that in times like now, we're especially in need of protection from the divine. So I pray to God. I pray for protection, for guidance to help me be the best person that I can be, to help me stay strong in times that are tough. And we're gonna have some tough times ahead, but it's gonna get better eventually. It's just that we have to stick up for what's right. We have to speak up when it's appropriate to do so. And when we, when we have that strength from our creator, I think that we can do so much to make this world a better place. Yeah, well, thank you so much for that. And definitely we know from studies of the blue zones that that's one of the power nine is having that sense of, of connection. And, you know, some people may not feel like they're particularly religious or may, you know, spirituality may be a, dif a bit difficult for them, but there's definitely other avenues to try to access that same benefit through meditation or journaling, uh, reflection, things like that. So what a great habit to have. Definitely. Well, Dr. May, how can listeners connect with you and what services do you provide? My website, veganvet.net, is, uh, is providing veterinary house call services for Los Angeles. And uh, I also do telemedicine and phone consultations. So if people are um, living outside of that area or even if they're in that area and for whatever reason are, aren't up for an in-person visit, um, we can potentially arrange for a phone consultation or Skype consultation. I also uh, am doing the activism with the veterinary profession and that's, anywhere in the country, really, I can do that if I have a large enough audience. Of course, right now with the social distancing, it's not possible, but as soon as that's lifted, if people have access to clinics where we can have a gathering of, you know, say, 20 or more people, we can show a documentary such as Called to Rescue, and we can serve vegan food, and VAPA will sponsor the food and we will arrange it. We just need there to be an interest to support that effort. So anyone who's listening 
who may have a connection with a veterinary clinic or hospital or even a public venue, say a restaurant or a movie theater or someplace like that, that would be willing to let us use their space for a couple of hours and can help invite people to come to this event, um, we can work together to make this happen and spread awareness. It's really my life's work and uh, you know, I, I need help to make it a fruition, but we, we have the, the funds to do this, uh, you know, and we want to make it as impactful as possible. So we really would love for more people to get involved. If you contact me directly, you can email me. My email is veganvet at gmail.com. And my, uh, the VAPA website is vapavets.org, V-A-P-A-V-E-T-S.org. Okay, great. Well, we'll definitely have to have you come out to Yakima. We can definitely get a, a big enough group for that. That would be so amazing. Well, finally, I would love for you to give us a call to action for my listeners for the week. What is one thing that they can do this week to improve the lives of their pets? Yes, that's a great question. Dental care is so important for our animals' health. And there are a lot of things you can do. Brushing their teeth. If they won't let you brush their teeth, you can use plaque off, which is a seaweed-based supplement you can put on their food that enzymatically helps to break down plaque before it turns into tartar. If they have bad breath or they're having any difficulty eating, they really should see a veterinarian and have a professional dental cleaning done. Um, if it's pretty minimal or you're just starting out, you can use organic coconut oil, which has natural antibacterial properties and just gently massage it around the gums, especially focusing on the back area towards the back of the mouth. That's generally where the most tartar tends to accumulate. Cool. Can you use the coconut oil to brush their teeth with the, yes, with the toothbrush? Exactly. Yeah, oh, definitely. Wow. And uh, you can also use the pet flavored toothpaste, but sometimes it's just easier to use something that's uh, simple and it's devoid of any other ingredients that you may not be certain about. It's definitely vegan, you know that. So it's a, it's a good option and dogs and cats usually love the taste of coconut oil. Yeah, I might try that because my dog is one of those. She's only five pounds, but I cannot brush her teeth. I mean, like literally it is impossible. So I'm going to try it with the coconut oil and see if she'll let me. I've, she's pretty picky. So I think the flavor of the other stuff she doesn't like. So I'm going to try that. Okay. So our call to action this week is take care of the dental health of your pet. So either brush their teeth, think of using coconut oil. Um, or use a product like plaque off if you're really unable to brush their teeth, or if they're having symptoms of bad breath or, or dental problems, take them into their vet because they may need professional cleaning evaluation, those kinds of things. Yes. And also there's a water additive you can order from healthymouth.com that has organic fruit extracts that you put in their drinking water and they'll uh, be able to drink that and it'll naturally break down plaque before it turns into tartar. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm going to do all these things. Um, great. Oh, and one question about your consults. Are you able to do consults from anybody in the country and in the world, or do they have to be from California? Well, I, you know, it's depending on what it is that they need, I can assess on a case by case basis. I, in terms of prescribing medications and limited in terms of having the veterinary client patient relationship. But if it's um, something that I can give them general advice about, then I may be able to help them even if they're outside of California. So what they can do is go to my website and fill out um, a contact form, which has basic information about their animal and what it is they need help with. And then I can review that and determine if it's something that I can help them with and we'll go from there. Perfect. Yeah, because I imagine just like in pediatrics where some people find it hard to find a pediatrician that supports them raising their children with a vegan diet. I'm sure it happens in, in the veterinary field too, where there are Definitely. some pet parents that they really want to do it, but they got the fear put in them by their current vet and they're not sure. So they may need like a little nutritional consult. So yeah, I will definitely link your website and um, Dr. Armighty May, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for being on Veggie Doctor Radio today. 
Thank you. It's an honor to be included. And hopefully we will be seeing you in person after all of this uh, pandemic stuff blows over. Yes. But I hope that you have a very plantastic day. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Thank you for tuning in. And I look forward to having you back again next week. A very special thank you to the band Rocket Surgeons for permission to use the broccoli song. To find out more about the Rocket Surgeons, please visit their website at rocketsurgeonsband.com or Facebook at Rocket Surgeons Music. Please subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Also, all of my social media links can be found in the podcast description. Send me a message and let me know what you think of today's podcast. Sharing is caring. Please share, rate, and review my podcast and drop me a line if you have ideas for future episodes. Thank you once again and have a plantastic day. We're having broccoli.